This is Open Line with today's host, Father Brian Malady. In North America, call toll free 1 833 288 EWTN. That's 1 833 288 3986. Outside North America, call 1 205 271 2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Hey, welcome again to the fastest moving show on Catholic Radio. It's Open Line, and today being a Thursday, we are joined by Father Brian Milady. How are you there, Padre? Okay. You're slowly recovering from COVID, right? It's a long, uh, a long tail on that kite. That's right. Long-term effects. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, yeah. we're certainly keeping you in our prayers, and uh, we will also uh, let everybody know what the phone number is if you have a question for Father Brian, and that would be 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Now, if you're listening to us outside of North America, please dial the U.S. country code and then 205-271-2985. You can also shoot us an email if you prefer that, openline at EWTN.com, openline at EWTN.com. Be sure you put Thursday or Father Brian in the subject line. Now, we're going to go to the phones uh, in just a few moments here. Uh, Matt Gabinski, our phone screener, is going to uh, get things set up for that. And uh, also, we'll uh, probably get some people who are watching us on YouTube or Facebook Live because we're streaming there right now. Those of you who want to ask a question of Father Brian can certainly put that question in the comments box. Our uh, social media guru, Jeff Burson, will put that in the um, in the chat screen here so we can get your question on the air as well. Right now, I want to lead off with uh, today's topic, Father, and that is Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, right? Right. Well, of course, we're going to celebrate their feast day soon. Yes. And it's interesting that before it was only the feast of St. Martha, but Mary and Lazarus got shoved in there too. And I think there's a reason for that. First of all, Bethany is figures prominently in all four of the Gospels. And it's kind of like Jesus's extended family. You know, we all need friends that aren't just a part of our blood relatives. And in Jesus' case, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus seem to fill that bill. Not only that, but in the famous miracle there, and it's hard to imagine what the effect of that miracle must have been on people, (laughs) Lazarus dies, and they send him, because he's his friend, you know, come, come, mourn over him, whatever. He doesn't come. Well, I mean, gosh... What kind of friend is this that he won't he would come? So he delays his departure by a few days, and purposely, of course, because of the miracle he wants to perform. And when he gets there, as you remember, Martha is always busy about the household chores, mm-hmm. but Mary just sits at home. And she basically says, tell Mary to help me, Lord. And he criticizes Martha, not for her industriousness, but because she isn't happy doing the things that she's doing and she wants to interfere with someone else. And this has been traditionally taken as the active and contemplative life where Mary is said to have chosen the better part because she's chosen the contemplative life. Then there's this this dialogue that Martha has with Christ I know if you'd been here, my brother would never have died. And he says, well, you know, your brother's going to come back to life again. She says, well, I know there is a resurrection of the dead. And he says, which is quite a thing for the Jews at that time. And he says, you know, I am the resurrection and the life. And then he goes to that tomb and he just says, Lazarus, come forth. I can't imagine the effect on the people who had been there, because remember, he's been dead for a number of days. They say there's going to be a terrible stench Mm -hmm. when Lazarus actually walks out of the tomb. (laughs) And uh, also, if you recall, a lot of people came to see the miracle. They believed in Christ because of it, and that even inflamed the jealousy of the leadership of Israel more, where they sought to kill him, and not only kill him, but they would have liked to have killed Lazarus too. Now, we know that Lazarus didn't come back to the resurrection of the dead 
in the sense that will rise from the dead at the end of time, he could die again. But the fact that Christ has the power to bring someone who's been dead for a number of days back into this world shows, first of all, his great mercy, his love for us. And secondly, you know, they are his friends, and so um, he wishes to stay with them again and enjoy their friendship. So in our religion, we mustn't ever underestimate the power of friendship, and especially the power of friendship is demonstrated to us in a place like Bethany. You know, they obviously all have their different personalities, Mm -hmm. but the Lord appreciates each one for whom they are, and he also doesn't hesitate to use this incident as a means to teach us about our own resurrection and our own life. So we should value our friends as Christ valued his and realize that they make life more livable. Absolutely. Appreciate that. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we're going to uh, go to the phones in just a few minutes here. The, and the number to call for EWTN's Open Line Thursday and talk with Brother Brian Milady is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Or if you prefer, shoot us a, an email here, openline at EWTN.com. Interesting question here from Keith. How should Catholics handle anger. What do you think, Father? Oh, gosh, that's a long, interesting topic. (laughs) In fact, the psychiatrist I follow, Dr. Bars, wrote an article that was posthumously published on anger, and it's 40 pages long. Mm. So it's quite a a developed topic for him. There's two points when it comes to anger. The first is that anger is about evil, in the sense that it's what motivates a person to try to correct an evildoer. That's the first point. But the second point is, many of us don't forgive others because, for one thing, we refuse to believe that we're angry or we think there's something evil about anger, and so we kind of suppress it. Well, no one really did anything to me. Now, that isn't true. I mean, you have to be honest. If someone has treated you badly you have to have the ability to admit that and then the natural reaction to this is anger why because anger is the emotion given to us to defend ourselves against evil a person who can never feel anger is helpless before evil and uh, one of the reasons we think it's always evil is because it is some an emotion we haven't learned to deal with in our contemporary society. So when children, for example, are corrected for throwing tantrums, Dr. Barr says, well, okay, fine. The child isn't going to hurt himself by beating his head against the floor. He's certainly not going to hurt the floor. <laughs> and it's all to get your attention, mm-hmm. basically. Mm-hmm. And if you just ignore him or you don't punish him for feeling anger, then that doesn't fit the bill. Eventually, the child realizes they're not getting through. Secondly, now, of course, if they do something that's unjust, like break a lamp or slap someone or something like that, Mm -hmm. they can be punished for that, but there needs to be a distinction about that. Now, the trouble is, what do you do when all your reasonable attempts to resolve anger have not met the bill? There are people who are still angry with someone. For example, they can't correct. Let's say the person's dead. In my order, we have some people who are still angry with a superior who died, I think, about 1975. Really? And they go to, oh, yes, and they go to the cemetery to be sure he's still there, I think. (laughs) Wow. But, I mean, obviously, this man... Wherever he is, he doesn't care. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so you, you can hold on to your anger, let it destroy you. Or, and this is the Christian mode, mm-hmm. you can make a reasonable choice 
to forgive the person and move on, not because you're justifying what they do, but because there's nothing you can do about it. Sure. So why lose your peace of soul over something that can't be changed? Yeah. And uh, also, when it comes to anger, Scripture tells us, be angry and don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. So it's not always evil. And that's shown by the fact that our Lord, on several occasions, was very angry. Yeah. Well, very good. And thank you, Keith, uh, for your email. If you would like to send us an email for a future show, the address ctc at e- I'm sorry, uh, open line at EWTN.com, open line at EWTN.com. Hey, phone lines are open for you right now to uh, talk with Father Brian Milady. Our number 833-288-EWTN for Open Line Thursday with Father Brian Milady. EWTN's cathedrals across America and the Diocese of Winona, Rochester in southern Minnesota invite you to a celebration of apostolic succession from the Co-Cathedral of St. John the Evangelist, the mass of installation of the Most Reverend Robert E. Barron as the ninth Bishop of Winona, Rochester. Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio Essentials. I heard an old joke that shows the difference between an optimist and a pessimist. A pessimist child was brought into a room of toys. He hung his head low and said, I'll probably break one. An optimist child was brought into a room of horse manure. He jumped in, started digging and said, there's gotta be a horse in here somewhere. (laughs) Now, some of us are just naturally optimists and some are pessimists, but for the Christian, there's something deeper than both those options. It's something called hope. Hope comes from confidence in God's love for us. That no matter what we face in life, God's only motive for allowing it is love. When things look like a pile of manure, you can trust that love. When things break you down on the outside, you can trust that it's part of the plan for your eternal glory and He's building you up on the inside. Scripture tells us that all things work together for the good for those who love and serve God. That's not a call to be an optimist, but to be full of hope. This is Chris Stefanik from Real Life Catholic. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. All right, calls are coming in right now for Open Line Thursday with Father Brian Milady. Let me give you that number one more time here, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you haven't been on uh, the EWTN website lately, let me tell you about something beautiful there. It is uh, a wonderful website dedicated to Mother Angelica, where you can celebrate her remarkable life. This uh, Mother Angelica Memorial is filled with photos, milestones, heartfelt stories, and her wit and words that have inspired the hearts of all ages throughout the years. We miss her, and uh, this website tells you exactly how much because an awful lot of love was put into this. Visit EWTN.com slash Mother Angelica today. EWTN.com slash Mother Angelica. If you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN. We begin today with Gary in Buffalo, listening on the great station of the cross. Hey, Gary, what's on your mind today, sir? Hello, gentlemen. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, I uh, was interested in uh, knowing where in the Bible or in the tradition is the state of grace. I can kind of uh, figure it out, like, when you're alive, uh, being in the state of grace from different things, different verses and things, but how about when you pass that you have to be in the state of grace? Um, where is that, like, d- definitive um, in the Bible or in tradition? Okay. Well, first of all, the famous text on the state of grace is Second Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 4. He has given them great and precious gifts that they may become partakers of a divine nature. And Christ is constantly talking about the kingdom of God being in our hearts. He's constantly discussing the fact that now the Holy Spirit uh, dwells in our souls. And since it's God that we're going to see in heaven, 
it's absolutely necessary that we be in a proper state uh, when we die. And uh, St. Paul talks a great deal about this. So that it's all over scripture. You can't just say one text. Although that text, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4, is the traditional text that the Council of Trent, and I believe also the Catechism, uses mm -hmm. to express what the state of grace is, which is basically, as it says, partaker of God's nature. And the, in other words, we're elevated while we're here on earth to participate in the life of the Holy Trinity, mm -hmm. which means that we can have a loving conversation, a daily basis, moment basis, with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whom we say we love here on earth so much, that's what we're going to get when we go to heaven. All right. Gary, is that helpful for you? Yes. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Father. All right. Sure. You're most welcome. And that opens up a line for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. If you call right now, we can probably get you on today's edition of Open Line Thursday. 833-288-3986 if you have a question for Father Brian Milady. We're going now to Jim, a first-time caller in Columbus, Ohio, listening on the blowtorch there, St. Gabriel Radio. We call it the blowtorch because it has a, a wonderful... Uh, Big AM signal. It covers almost the whole state of Ohio, Father. Pretty wow. amazing. It is. Uh, Jim, what's on your mind today? Yes, hi. Uh, I wonder if you can uh, explain to me, if there is a person uh, within the church in a very high position that's a heretic, uh, how does the church go about in it uh, making sure, it's almost just like when you try to uh, take steps to have someone who is a saint, there's certain steps that has to be taken or certain things that have to be uh, uh, administered. How, how is the, that work when somebody is in a, uh, a higher position, a, a, a higher position in the church, if they are making decisions, doing things uh, that, is, that is, uh, uh, can be conceived as heresy? Okay. Well, there are several points you have. First of all, uh, you have to remember that one of the first heretics was the Patriarch of Constantinople, Nestorius. So that's a very high position in the Church. It's equivalent to, well, almost equivalent to the Pope, right? Secondly, uh, if you think that someone is teaching something that isn't correct, it's very hard for us to change people like that, especially that are in high positions of authority. However, there was a pope in the Middle Ages <laughs> who condemned the friars, that's the Franciscans and the Dominicans, from teaching in universities. And so the friars immediately began to uh, say litanies for the death of the pontiff. Wow. wow. <laughs> and the pope died within a month. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so they used to say, beware the litanies of the friars. Uh -huh. Look, there's a, you can always go to a higher authority, but if the higher authority is won't listen, or they're so bureaucratized they can't get it through, or they're not interested, well, you know, as I say, these people are mortal. So and the trouble is we don't have an organ apart from the papacy in the final analysis to change these things. And if the papacy won't act or whatever, well, we just have to live with it until the situation changes. Mm -hmm. uh, I know this is a very inadequate answer, but we just don't have impeachment, unfortunately. Yeah. Or like in Britain, where the prime ministers have never known a vote of confidence, you could reelect someone then. It mm -hmm. just doesn't work that way. All right. Hey, Jim, thanks so much uh, for your call. And uh, we have lines open for you here on EWTN's Open Line Thursday. Our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Quick question here from Victor. When Jesus was on earth, was he part of the Trinity on earth and in heaven? I don't quite understand what he means by the Trinity on earth. Yeah, me neither. He was certainly a member of the Blessed Trinity, whether he, remember, the, the classic text is what he was, he remained. What he was not, he assumed. Right. So he remained um, the second person of the Trinity, but he assumed a new way of acting. So when Jesus on earth speaks, the, the second person in the Trinity mm -hmm. speaks. 
In other words, there's no separate person in Christ. There's only one person in Jesus of Nazareth, and that's the divine person of the Word. There are two natures, but there's only one person. And in fact, it's interesting that Christ, in some texts, speaks in both natures as the one person. So the classic one is, Father, glorify me, that's in the human nature, with the glory that I had with you before the world began. That's the divine nature. So you have the, um, the one identity person who speaks in one or another nature, and those natures are in communion, but they, uh, you know, without separation, without division. Mm -hmm. This is the famous line from the Cal Council of Chalcedon. So, uh, yes, he was the person of the word, and there was no other person than the person of the word. And that person of the word remains in communion with the Trinity and also speaks. Okay. Appreciate that. Victor, thank you so much for your email. Let's go now to Garen in Anchorage, Alaska, listening on the great KHRA. Hey there, Garen. What's on your mind today, sir? I wonder how literate um, the people Jesus was talking to, the people who surrounded him, how literate were they about prophecy? Um, one example was... Um, Martha, the brother of Lazarus, when he died, Martha said, I know I will see him at the end of the age. But, you know, I don't remember which chapter in John that was. But how did they know about that? How literate were they about prophecy? Well, the Jews were very... Um well educated, but not not necessarily in writing and reading, but they were very well educated when it came to their religion, because it was the thing they were most interested in. You know, like we have now people who can recite to you the sports thing from twenty five years ago. Well, the Jews were highly uh, educated in their religion, and the famous resurrection of the dead idea. That had come to exist around the time of our Lord. Before, people didn't have a great notion of it. The prophecy of Ezekiel is a part of it about the bones coming to life again. Also, the prophecy um, in Job, I know that my Redeemer lives and I my, whom I shall myself shall see. Mm -hmm. uh, those things, but they're very hidden and veiled, obviously. So the immortality of the body as well as the soul in the sense of the body being risen again is something that was uh, probably a great debate and also uh, of common interest at that time. And Martha obviously had come to uh, be educated at that. So, but again, they looked on the resurrection as merely the physical body come to life again as the manner of this world. That's not the same as the resurrection of the dead that our Lord uh, promises. Okay. Because our body comes to exist after the manner of the next world, not after this world. Okay. Garen, is that helpful for you? Yeah, yeah, that does explain. Thank you. You are most welcome. It's Open Line Thursday with Father Brian Mullady. Lines are open for you at 833 833- 288-EWTN, that's 833-288-3986, or if you prefer, shoot us an email, openline at EWTN.com. Father, here's a question from Sharon. When a priest offers a blessing over the radio, is it efficacious every time, even when recorded? <laughs> a recorded blessing? Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think it's efficacious as recorded. However, if it's over the radio and it has some kind of personal contact and it's actually occurring, mm -hmm. I would say that it would be efficacious then. Okay, very good. And a quick one here from Joe now. What is the common thinking of how old people will appear to be in heaven? I guess they're talking about well, their, their oh. appearance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the common thinking is, of course, that the resurrected body, whatever defects your body may have had, will be resolved. So, for example, if you lost a hand, you get that back in the resurrected body. And uh, also, the traditional idea is that the blessed will be 
probably around the same age as Christ, 33. Mm. And, uh, but again, no one's really sure. It's interesting that in the paintings of heaven of Fra Angelico, mm -hmm. all the blessed have baby faces, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So it emphasizes the new life. I'm not, I don't know. I, do, I, I would say that the fact that we get back the defects that our, of our body may has take, have taken from us is certainly true. How what you look like, I don't know, but it's supposed to be very nice. Fascinating. Appreciate that, Joe. Thanks so much for your email. In a moment, we'll be talking with Jack in Lafayette, Louisiana. Also, Russ, and a couple of lines are open for you right now. And like we say, if you call now, we'll probably get you on today's show. 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Open line Thursday with Father Brian Mullady. There are a lot of ways to pray. When I was in the evangelical world, we didn't we didn't like rote prayers that the Catholics prayed. Nah, we we wanted to say our own prayers. We thought that it was coming more from the heart. Any kind of prayer, whether it comes from the heart and is a loose connection of words, or it is a prayer that the church has had for centuries, is good because it is prayer. We live in a world of extreme polarization, often consumed by anger and anxiety, a climate that is dividing our country and our world, a division so wide there is even confusion within our church. And today, most secular news sources only serve to deepen this divide. But at Catholic News Agency, our mission is to be a witness to the truth of our Catholic faith, providing trustworthy, relevant, and timely news affecting the global church, as well as in-depth coverage of the Pope, the Vatican, the church in the U.S., and the ongoing battle for the culture of life. Every day, CNA's reporters and editors maintain a continuous, faithful watch on the people and the events that impact lives and the souls of Catholics, delivering more news from a Catholic perspective than anyone else. Catholic News Agency, a service of EWTN News. Trusted, timely, Catholic. Engage at catholicnewsagency.com. Open Line Thursday is on YouTube. Search YouTube to find the EWTN YouTube channel so you'll never miss an episode of our show or any of your favorite EWTN radio shows. What would you like to discuss? Let us know tomorrow on our monthly unscripted show on Take Two with Jerry and Debbie. On most of these EWTN stations. Now back to Open Line with Father Brian Milady. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Glad you're with us for Open Line Thursday with Father Brian Mullady here on EWTN. Our phone number 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Right back to it for Jack in Lafayette, Louisiana, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Hello, Jack. What's on your mind today, sir? Good afternoon. How y'all doing today? Doing thank great. Thank you very much for taking. Thank you, thank you, well, thank you very much for taking my call. Uh, it must have been a calling from above for me to switch what I was listening to previously to switch it on to you guys. And uh, Father Brian, I'm very thankful for your service to the church. Um, you're actually my favorite Dominican, uh, even though I don't know you. But uh, I just want to tell you, uh, you're right on, and I do appreciate you very much. And I'm asking you for some advice, or if you can give it to me. Um, I I'm a professional, and uh, I have a reputation that's on the line. Um, I, I attend church every weekend, uh, make that a habit, but I have some bad habits. And when I go to confession to ask for forgiveness of, of these habits, um, I tend to be repetitive with these habits, and I keep on confessing the same thing. My question is, are my sins forgiven? And even though they are repetitive, um, will, will God still have mercy on me? Um, I'm doing my best to stop these habits, Father, but it is very, very difficult. All right. I think I know what you're asking. Uh, 
which is a typical question, really. Yours is not that unusual. Um, yes, your sins are forgiven, but the fact that you have weaknesses still remains. And the reason Christ established confession was because he realized that one conversion wasn't enough for us. Mm. <laughs> that, you know, I mean, we have, we all have some kind of conversion experience when we, you know, enter the Catholic faith, uh, whether it's an adult or a baby, but he knew that we would be weak. And he established confession for weak people. Because why would you need to go and be cleansed if, uh, uh, you know, you could do it for yourself or you never we were perfect? There's very few people that are really that perfect in this life where they don't need to confess fairly often. Although since Vatican II, I don't know why really. I have some suspicions from the 70s, some certain moral teachings that were done in the 70s. Mm. But people don't seem to believe in frequent confession anymore. And uh, they'll say, well, I see the same things over and over again. It seems useless. Well, but you know, you could say the same thing about, um, you know, physical health. Suppose you went to a doctor and you said, I have a pain. And the doctor said, great, where is it? Well, I won't tell you. <laughs> well, how many times does he have it? I won't tell you. Well, is it a big pain or a little pain? Well, I won't tell you. Now, how can the doctor prescribe the healing mm -hmm. if the, um, the difficulty, the disease, isn't known? In a similar way, we have the spiritual diseases. We have spiritual diseases that uh, affect our uh, daily lives. And not in the sense that we feel we'll get away with it, where you just do it because you, well, I'll do this, but I can always confess, in a kind of recidivist fashion. But in the sense that it's a weakness you have and you're sincerely working on, that's something that you need to confess over, even if it's just venial sins. That's why a church requires the confession of mortal sins, but it still highly recommends the confession of venial sins because... Um, of this problem we have that we need to express the places where we need constant healing. Mm -hmm. So don't ever doubt the fact that your sins are forgiven and the fact that you have to tell them over and over again. Well, it's like having a chronic disease. You have to tell over and over again uh, to the doctor what the symptoms are right now. But it doesn't in any sense do away with the forgiveness of sins. What it does is it makes it more specific to you. Jack, uh, thank you so much for your call. Father, years ago, I, I mentioned this to a priest friend of mine because I noticed that I was doing the same thing, that I was confessing the same sins over and over again, even though I was working on them, and the priest knew that, and he said, well, don't beat yourself up then. You're you're doing fine as long as you keep persevering on those sins and... and uh, you know, keep keep plugging away at, at trying to get rid of them. Right. So there's there we are. And confessing them a frequent confession is yes. the way you do that. Right? All right. Open line Thursday with Father Brian Milady here on EWTN. Our phone number 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Richard is listening in Charleston, South Carolina. Hey, Richard, what's on your mind today, sir? Yeah, thank you for taking my call, and good afternoon. My question relates to uh, to the passage that says he descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again. Can Father please explain what, what is meant? Where does that phrase come from, and can he explain a bit um, what transpired uh, between death All and right. resurrection? Okay. All right. All right, well, the harrowing of hell is a... Uh, Beautiful doctrine, really, because the term hell there is used to include what we call the limbo of the just, because those people haven't seen God yet. Those are the people that came before Christ, and they believed in him implicitly, but he hadn't died on the cross yet. So once he dies on the cross, then he who evangelized the earth for three years now goes and evangelizes the people who believed in him 
for three days in the netherworld. And the term hell is, again, a very nebulous term. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that the Latin text for that particular part of the creed has to do with the depths, but it basically means the same thing. Um, in, the old, in the English translation, at least, from which was made, what, 400 years ago? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, in other words, Christ goes there in order to take those people to heaven with him when he rises in the dead. And Fra, Fra Angelico has an absolutely beautiful painting of the harrowing of hell, and it has Christ knocking down the doors, the stones, the gates, with a resurrection banner in his hand, and all these people who believed in him, all the patriarchs of the Old Testament, maybe he's a pagan, who knows, all these people who believe in him come running over to greet him. So uh, that's the doctrine of the harrowing of hells. And that's what it means in the creed. In other words, between the time he died on the cross, uh -huh. when he was physically in the tomb here on earth, he uh, spiritually went to evangelize all those people who had believed in him and waiting for th sometimes for thousands of years to be saved in order to bring them to heaven with him. All right. And thank you so much. Uh, Richard, is that helpful for you, Richard? Yeah, that's a beautiful explanation. I've never heard that before. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, here's a question now from Vincent. If someone is in mortal sin but loses their memory, what happens to their soul if they die? Well, obviously, uh, you have to confess every remembered mortal sin. Mm -hmm. And if you've lost your memory, then uh, you can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> so no one's bound to what's impossible. And if that's impossible, then uh, there's no problem with you not doing it. Okay. Um, if, if it's possible, you, you have to do it. But if if it's not possible, God doesn't bind anyone in the impossible. Very good. Open line Thursday with Father Brian here on EWTN. Last chance here to get those phone calls in at 833-288-EWTN. If you've got a question for Father Brian Milady, love to get your question on the radio and get it answered. 833-288-3986. Lisa wants to know, why did God create people when there was a possibility that they could go to hell? Oh, gosh, people ask me this question all the time. <laughs> um, he, well, he created people because he wanted them to go to heaven because he's good, and he wanted to share his goodness. You remember, good is diffusive of itself, and at least when I was uh, a boy inside the Baltimore Catechism, mm -hmm. the very second question was, why did God make me? And the answer was, God made me to show forth his goodness and to make me happy with him in heaven. Now, of course, God doesn't want slaves. And uh, he wants sons and daughters and, mm -hmm. and, and heirs. So he, that he allows you the freedom to choose heaven or hell. But the reason he created the world was that people would go to heaven. And that's pr primarily seen in how Adam and Eve were created before the sin. I mean, they're the ones that chose to want to pull, grasp it all themselves and to uh, not obey the law of God and things like that. He gave them this beautiful world to live in. He gave them this beautiful interior life. So they walked with God with, and would talk with God as an intimate in the garden. No, that, I take that in a spiritual sense in their hearts. He gave them no uh, difficulties in virtue. You know, um, they had an easy virtue uh -huh. because their passions in no sense warred against their higher self. He gave them all this stuff out of his love, out of the gift, as John Paul II says. And instead, they wanted it on their own. So they wanted it apart from the giver and apart from the gift of love. Okay. Appreciate that. It's uh, uh, Open Line Thursday with Father Brian Milady here on EWTN Radio. Coming up this weekend on Light of the East with Father Thomas Loya. You know, natural disasters, threats of war, the raging of the sea, fire in the sky, people dying of fright. These are the signs that Jesus Christ gave to warn us of the end times. So are the end times near? Well, the answer is both yes and 
We don't know. <laughs> Father, what uh, find out what Father Thomas Loy is talking about on Light of the East Radio coming up Sunday morning at 11:30 a.m. Eastern, right here on EWTN Radio. Light of the East with Father Thomas Lawyer. That's coming up Sunday morning at 11:30 a.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Here's a question now, Father, from Grace. How do I explain scripturally? why we pray to St. Michael the Archangel for his help in the battle against evil. Well, to my knowledge, St. Michael isn't exactly mentioned too many times in Scripture. No, no. Um, But the angelic intercession is a part of the tradition, so that's why you can't just judge things by Scripture. Mm. Uh, The angelic intercession is something which is... Uh, well, it's all behind the Old Testament, you know. Mm-hmm. Remember, in the Old Testament, the angels come and they bring all kinds of things. Think of Tobias uh, and the Archangel Raphael. And uh, I believe Michael is described, but I believe it's in the Apocalypse, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Um, the, the whole tradition of the church, following the tradition of Israel, is that angelic mediators are the way we experience the... Uh, fullness of God's message, because he's given them care over the earth. You could see this, for example, in Job. Remember, not only do they have angelic mediators, but God permits Satan to run around the earth and torment yeah. people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. So the whole tradition of the uh, angels is something that primarily comes from the Old Testament, although you can find references to the idea also in Aristotle, because Aristotle had what he called separated substances, which didn't have a body and weren't God. So that's what we would call the angels. Okay. And thank you so much, uh, Grace, for your question via email. If you'd like to send us an email for a future show, the address ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com. Let's go now to uh, Carmel in Midland, Texas, listening on the great Guadalupe radio. Carmel, what's on your mind today? So I got a question about uh, Luke, and it's uh, chapter 17, verse 37. Um, And it says, And he said to them, Where, Lord? He said to them, Where the body is, the eagle will be gathered together. And it just kind of flies over my head, just like the eagle does. That's something (laughs) I can grasp and what what he's trying to get at. Okay. Well, just off the top of my head, I really don't know. So I'd have to look it up and do a little research, yes. I don't have the Bible memorized, though. Yeah. All interpretation of all the virtues, the the verses, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, well, then, uh, thank you so much for your call. Here's Patrick now in San Antonio, uh, listening there also on Guadalupe Radio. Patrick, what's on your mind today? Uh, thanks for taking my call. I have a question about an individual who develops a disease such that that person can no longer swallow or talk. How do they receive the body of Christ as such? Well, if they can't swallow anymore. Obviously, they can't receive the body of Christ. If they can swallow the precious blood, even a drop of it, mm-hmm. then they can receive part of the precious blood. Okay. Patrick, thanks for your call. Robert wants to know, how do I explain to my non-denominational girlfriend how the rosary is beneficial to your spiritual life? (laughs) Well, (laughs) lots of luck. Yeah. Um, The thing is that uh, you want to emphasize the fact that repetitive prayer, uh, repetitive prayer, is a part of many religions. It isn't just a part of ours. And the fact that we choose to use the Virgin Mary's um, salutation in the beginning, the angelic salutation, Mm -hmm. is a part of our desire to experience God's love in such a way that Mary helps and supports us in this. And what better... A tool, or what better help can you have than going to a guy's mother to try to, uh, you know, um, intercede for us? Uh In fact, they say, uh, I think I heard this since Dr. Hahn, 
that in the Israelite court, the queen mother was much more important than the wife, the queen. Hmm. So we're going to the queen mother to have influence with the son. Now, again, the rosary in its uh, origin is shrouded in the past, but it's been a highly effective tool for helping people to concentrate on God. And the, you know, the Hail Marys and the Our Fathers, we could meditate just on the content of those prayers, but we can also do so on the mysteries, or we can just use it as a background mm -hmm. in which we spend 15 or 20 minutes every day being aware of the divine presence. And also, it's a physical thing. Now, you know, I was a hospital chaplain when I was young, a long time ago, in the summers. And I used to find that with people, all they had to do was hold the rosary. And it gave them a kind of a spiritual strength. Mm. So all those things, it's very human to use repetitive prayer, a physical instrument of repetitive prayer, and especially connected to the mother of our Lord in order for us to frame our minds and our spirits in a kind of contemplative dimension. Robert, thanks so much uh, for your email. Here's a question now from Lauren. Is it a sin against the second commandment to name a child Jesus? No, it's not. The second commandment has to do with taking the name of the Lord in vain. And the term in vain there primarily, primarily refers to evil usages of this to, mm -hmm. you know, um, curse someone or to oaths sworn in court to perjury so that a person calls upon the name of God to witness to a truth in public that they themselves know to be false. Those are the primary places where... Um, uh, the, uh, we would say the name of the Lord in vain. No, it's not at all. In fact, as you know, there are a number of cultures, especially Hispanic cultures, yes. that do name their children after Jesus. So there you go. Appreciate that. Now, Lauren, thanks so much for your question. Vic wants to know, how did the tradition of the diaconate come to be? Oh, well, uh, the diaconate is from the early church. It's, I believe it's mentioned... I remember St. Stephen and company, they were all seven of them, mm -hmm. and they were supposed to help the apostles with their work. Mm -hmm. So it's in the Acts of the Apostles. Um, Way back. Yes, and St. Stephen was the uh, first protomartyr of the church. He's the first person to die for the faith. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Lawrence is another deacon who's from the early church and also suffered martyrdom in Rome. So the diaconate is a scriptural origin. Okay. Appreciate that. And Vic, thanks so much for your question. Here's one now from Joanne. I have trouble comprehending the body and blood of Christ. I am experiencing difficulty when I imagine actually eating him or consuming him. How can I better receive and understand this? All right. I would say that you have to keep in mind what the church's doctrine is. Uh, we do believe that when the priest says the words of institution, this is my body and this is my blood, over the host and the chalice, that in everything except the appearances, we use the word accidents mm -hmm. for that, mm -hmm. they cease to be um, bread and wine, but they become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And yet they're a sacramental presence in the sense that if I move the host here, Jesus' body in heaven doesn't get moved too. It's Jesus' body in heaven that becomes present here on earth. So um, if you were taking this in too literalist a sense, the Protestants used to accuse of cannibalism, saying that you actually munch flesh and things like that. Mm. Well, substantially you do, but not, not accidentally. So um, the presence of Christ doesn't change the molecules of the bread and wine mm -hmm. into the molecules of Jesus' body. They remain the molecules of bread and wine. So it's a very beautiful doctrine because what God has done is give us the ability to mix our 
bodies with his in heaven and at the same time to mix our souls with his in his accepted sacrifice. And also there aren't 10 trillion bodies of Christ around the world in all the hosts that are in the tabernacles. There's only one body of Christ that's present equally in 10 trillion different places so that each receives him and the whole Christ when, when they receive him. So it's, it has to be a middle line between an accessible cannibalistic presence where only the, where the, subs, uh, the accidents are changed too, mm -hmm. to an excessively uh, idealistic presence where the substance and the accidents still remain bread and wine, but we just consider them to be the body of Christ. And it has to be in between. Okay. It really is the body of Christ, but the accidents remain the same. Very good. And uh, Joanne, we hope that's helpful for you. Thanks so much for your question. Open Line Thursday with Father Brian Mullady here on EWTN Radio. Helen says, I go to Mass and Confession for the souls in purgatory. Someone told me that my actions are worthless and cannot do anything. Is this true? No, of course it's not true. Uh, the souls in purgatory are people, obviously. Yeah. And they're people who... Uh, we have to make satisfaction for our sin, atone for our sin, and that will be whether we're on earth or in purgatory. The difference between the two is that here, because we have bodies, we can make positive acts of purgation ourselves. So let's say I'm dying of cancer. I can offer my sufferings for, you know, the satisfaction of my own sins or for sins of others. Mm -hmm. But after you die, because you don't have a body, there's no positive um, atonement you can make. It's all negative. It's passive purgation. So that means that I merely suffer. I don't do any acts which would hurry this along personally. What the person does who prays for the soul in purgatory is they're on earth. They can make positive acts. And so they try to help along this process. And it's a process which is helped along by a union of love and the union of love through the cross of Christ. Okay. Thank you so much for your question, Helen. We're going to go out on this one, Father. This is from Sam. If angels have perfect knowledge of God and they have free will, why would some rebel and some not? Well, they have perfect knowledge of God in the sense of intellectual knowledge. Mm -hmm. But um, they rebelled in the sense that they wanted this all on their own terms. And uh, so it was their sin was a sin of pride. Um, they wanted to grasp at being God mm -hmm. and not rely upon him to give them grace to make them so. Okay. Sam, we hope that's helpful for you. Father, we're uh, wrapping it up here, a fast-moving show. Could you please leave us with your blessing? May the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Father, we hope that you continue on your healing ways and that you'll be feeling even better next Thursday. Me too. Yeah, kind of, <laughs> okay. kind of a drag like the song says. That's right. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Appreciate all that you do for us. Uh, tomorrow at this time, Jack Williams will be back with you, along with our Friday host, Mr. Colin Donovan, answering all sorts of theological questions, so be sure to tune in for that. On behalf of our fantastic team here, I'm Tom Price, along with Father Brian Milady. Thanks for joining us today on Open Line Thursday. We'll see you next time. God bless.